This is the third Sunday of Advent, and Advent is the season when we continue to consider the significance of Jesus' you might say, comings to the earth, uh, both the first and the second time. Uh, you might remember a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, on the first Sunday of, of, of Advent, we began, as the saying goes, we began with the end in mind. And the end, of course, is that Jesus is coming back again at the end of time. And the scriptures tell us that he will rule a new earth and a new heaven and as it says in Scripture, and he will reign forever and ever. He will reign forever and ever. Uh, Jesus told us what to do as we wait for his coming. He said, be prepared and continue to let the light, uh, my light, Jesus' light, shine through us to others, especially uh, one of his parables about this very thing. He said, especially invest yourself in the, the vulnerable, those who are, who are in need. So last week, we continued the, the, ad, the, the sort of the Advent sequence, the Advent journey, and Pastor Bill helped us to re, help remind us how hard it is for us to admit that, 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 that we're lost without Jesus. We are lost without Jesus. And I, I think I'll never forget his story about the, the husband and wife who were hiking in the Superstition Mountains, and they were very lost, very lost, and, and daylight was almost gone almost gone, and they didn't know, even know how lost they were. And so what was so memorable that they came to, to Bill to ask directions, and Bill gave them the exact directions. He got their map out. He pointed it out on the map, and they argued and disputed and started out to go another way because they thought they knew better. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it, was, it was crazy. Uh, and and, and, and their, their, their knowing better way was going to end up with them in the dark and very stranded because it was dusk and, and light was, was burning very quickly. <clears throat> Our lostness and God's great love for us is the reason for Jesus' coming. And in this Advent season, we remember Jesus' coming, his birth, his life, his resurrection, his death and resurrection, and his return. This is the central historical event. He's the person who is the central historical person in God's master plan for humanity and the world itself. And it's all about his love, his love for us, and the fact that he doesn't want us to end up in the dark, too. Now, we think about, though, even the people B.C., that is, before Christ, uh, were still looking forward to the hope of a Savior, to the uh, coming Messiah. God was revealing his plan to them. He was giving them directions, you might say. Uh, I think often that we get really confused, though, about, about what God's plan really is. Uh, we want it to be all about a trouble-free life. We just want life to be easy and, and trouble-free here on earth. And if, and if that is our measure, then I fear God's failing, isn't he? God, God, is, God is failing because Jesus told us very clearly, he said, in this world, he says, you will have trouble. He says, but be of good cheer, but for I have overcome the world. <clears throat> His plan has always been and always will be that he wants an honest and trusting relationship with each of us, where the challenges of the world, and we will have them, uh, actually grow us closer to God because we discover how dependent we are, how lost we are without him. He already loves us perfectly and is, just wants us to respond to that invitation to a relationship. Yes, God has a plan, and God's more than 500 years before Jesus, uh, God gave Isaiah, Isaiah these, these words that you see on the screen from Isaiah 7. He says, all right then, the, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. We sang about that earlier, uh, with that name, Emmanuel. But honestly, God, God's plan starts long before Bethlehem. It starts long before Bethlehem, even long before Isaiah. It goes back to the very beginning, back 
in the very beginning, in the beginning, in, into, into Genesis. And when we meet God in Genesis, uh, he is unlike any other God. <clears throat> he is not aloof and impersonal as most of the, the gods uh, that, that were worshipped by the people around. He's not a single function God. He's, he's like, like so many others. He's not just the sun God or the moon God or the, or the earth God or the river God. He's the capital G God. He's big. He's big. And though he's that big, we find out, though, he is completely accessible and completely personal. He is one, and he is awesome. And so in the very beginning, back at the Garden of Eden, we see that God is very good, and, and he even says his creation is very good. But then the pinnacle of his creation is the man and the woman. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created to live in a constant conversation with God. Think about that. That's how accessible God is. He wants a constant conversation with us. Uh, their lives are, are woven into God, and they had nothing to fear because they knew that God was, was there. He was always with them. And that's the most repeated promise in Scripture, isn't it? That, Do not be afraid. I will be with you. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. <clears throat> However, um, Adam and Eve were people <laughs> like you and me. And uh, they, thought, they liked their own plan better. They liked their own path better. Sort of like that, that, that couple in the superstitions. So they made choices and they, they decided they wanted to be their own God. And with those choices, we read in Genesis 3 that they were removed from the Garden of Eden. And it broke the perfect connection with God, but the break was from their side. The break was from their side. Because please hear me on this. That even since that time, since that point in time, God has been persistently inviting and pursuing people. God has been pursuing us to return to that close relationship, that, that unbroken conversation. In fact, in the next chapters of, of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 3 through 11, uh, most of the accounts of the people described in these next chapters show how devastating it is to live life by choosing to be your own God, by choosing your own path, following your own plan rather than God's. But, in Genesis chapter 12, at least from our standpoint, it, it, it kind of feels like God is restarting history with Abram and Sarai. But understand, it's not a restart. This is still part of God's plan. This is still part of God's plan. And God chooses them to be the, the father and mother of a family who is going to grow into a huge nation. A huge nation. He wanted to be close to them. He wanted, to he wanted them to respond to his love <clears throat> with trust. Just like he wanted Adam and Eve to respond to his love with trust. Just like he wants for you and me to respond to his love with trust. He promised them. He said, I will bless you. I will bless you. Why did, was he going to bless them? He was blessing them so what? They can be a blessing to others. Blessed to be a blessing. And so history continues, and at the end of Genesis, Abraham's family has now graduated, and it's now Isaac, and then Isaac's son Jacob, and, and it's become a huge nation. And this nation, very large nation, God's chosen family, falls into slavery at the hand of the king of Egypt, whose name is Pharaoh. And they are in slavery for 300 years. Think about that. Think about that. That's longer than the, almost the United States has been around. 300 years. Abraham's family are slaves. And they're probably thinking, okay, God, that plan that you have, it's not working right now. It's not working. 300 years. God, if you're blessing us, where's the blessing? Where's my comfortable life? But God is still working his plan. And 
in his time, he raises up Moses, and, and actually God goes and seeks him out personally. Remember the story of Moses finding the burning bush in the desert? He gets Moses' attention, and, and he chooses Moses to approach Pharaoh, and he promises to go with Moses the whole way. And with God's help and some massive displays of power along the way, Moses leads the children of Jacob, now called the children of Israel, out of slavery. And finally, when they're free, God, through Moses, personally leads his people on a 40-year journey through the promised land. Let's pick it up in Exodus chapter 13. It says, The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. You see, God travels with Israel. Clouds by day and fire by night, uh, they were a sign of God's constant presence with them. They could just look up and see, there he is. God's with us. Every day and every night, God is always available. And as Moses and Israel travel through, through the desert, they arrive at Mount Sinai, and God does something kind of interesting. He invites Moses to climb the mountain to meet with him. Again, in Exodus 24, it says, then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed, climbed higher into the mountain, and he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. God talks with Moses personally during this time and gives Moses the instructions that he needed as they were on the mountain. The, most, the best known part of the most well known part of those instructions is the stone tablets that God gave Moses that, of course, contain the Ten Commandments. They were chiseled on them. And, but in addition, God says, I'm going to make a way so that people can be even more connected with me. Exodus 25, he says, Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle with its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will, I will show you. So God instructs Moses to build this, this portable tent, actually, a, called a tabernacle, and so that the symbols of his presence could be close to the people. He wanted them to be even more aware of his presence. So God gives Moses all these details of an instruction, and the central feature of the tabernacle was a very holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. This was a portable chest that contained the stone tablets uh, with the Ten Commandments. Picking up in chapter 40, it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Tab tabernacle. Now, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. You see, God wanted them to have a more tangible sign of his presence with them. The tabernacle was with them all the time, and it was portable, so it moved with them. They'd be journeying, the cloud would stop, they would stop and set up camp all over again. It was a visible sign of God's presence with them. And so, as <clears throat> we know, Israel eventually arrives in the promised land as God had promised them, and, and after some years, God gives King David instructions to build him a temple. This is with bricks and mortar, and, and eventually King Solomon, King David's son, completes the temple. The temple is, is much more permanent and is a much more tangible sign for the people to understand God's presence with them. See what God's been doing all along the way? First, God used clouds, and he used fire, and then he used a portable tent, and now it's the temple to reassure the people of his presence with them always, that he's constantly there. It's always been and always will be God's plan to be closer and closer 
and closer to us and to provide a way for us to respond to his closeness. But eventually, even the temple didn't work. The people became complacent with the temple. They, they forget God's plan for them, that his, people was, <clears throat> was, his plan was for them to be close to him and not just focused on rituals inside of a building. And as the years went by, the temple leaders and the temple system became very corrupted and it lost its focus. And instead of the temple being used to, to love God and to be a house of prayer for, for all people and a blessing for, for, for all people, it became a tool for the, the powerful to oppress the weak. And the people's lifestyle and their worship began to drift from being God-centered to being self-centered. Well, many years pass, and kings come and go. And God keeps speaking. He keeps pursuing them. He, 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 he calls these guys that are called prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, to attempt to invite the people back to a closer relationship. And he wants to revive their, their, their empty, empty worship rituals. God even tells Micah another promise. He says, tell the people, here's what I want them to do. It's really simple. He says, just do what's right. Love mercy. Live humbly. He meant caring for the poor, caring for widows and orphans, and caring for the foreigners. Now, once again, if we were to pause at this moment in time, of history and evaluate how God's plan is doing, at least by the standards that, that we mostly have, we might conclude once again that God's plan to connect with people has failed because it just doesn't seem like these people are responding. But honestly, <laughs> if we pause at any isolated time in history, even today, we might be concluding the same thing. But God's still working. God is still actively working. And while Ahaz was king, God gives this, uh, his faithful prophet Isaiah this promise, the one we just read before, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. Another later promise through Isaiah, uh, for he said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Consular, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne, and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Now granted, Isaiah was taking words from God and he was prophesying about something that was going to come in the future and the, the people don't fully comprehend what Isaiah is saying and they continue to defy God. Uh, they continue to think that their pathway is, is better. And their worship becomes more of a show, uh, and their hearts are not in it. And they continue to neglect those around them who are in need. As history moves forward, God even uses other nations to, uh, and other kings who are not Jewish to, to, to work his plan. Eventually, after many, 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 many hundreds of years of disobedience, Babylon attacks and destroys Jerusalem and the temple. And the people are taken into exile in Babylon. Uh, see, the exile is a consequence for their disobedience after hundreds of years of clear warnings. But please understand, God's plan is still working. God's plan is still going on. The, the prophets describe that there's this faithful remnant that continues to trust God through all this. 
About 50 years after being in exile, God uses another non-Jewish leader, a king. His name is King Cyrus of Persia. He conquers Babylon and he sets the Jewish people free and a few Jews begin to head back to Jerusalem and they begin building their holy city and, and, and God's plan to be close to people continues. He, but he wants to be closer than a cloud. He wants to be closer than fire. He wants to be closer than a tent and closer than a building like a, like a, like a temple. And there's only one way to make this happen. There's only one way to make this happen. And as always, God makes it come to pass at exactly the right time. The scriptures use the word in the fullness of time, which means God's schedule, not ours. God's schedule. Interestingly enough, God's next big step doesn't happen in Jerusalem or in a big city. It doesn't happen next to or inside of the the brand new incredible temple that King Herod had built them. Instead, God God chooses a, 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 a very insignificant little town located about six miles outside of Jerusalem. The name of the city is Bethlehem. It happens to be King David's hometown. David had lived there a thousand years earlier, but at this time, it was a small, small little village, maybe about 300 people, scholars think. Now, next week and on Christmas Eve, we're going to pick up the rest of the story, you might say, in God's ongoing plan. Today, I want us to think about the ground that we've covered. We have, re- <laughs> we have reviewed the history of the world very quickly, <laughs> from creation to about 5 BC. We've gone through a lot of territory during this time. History, we think of it as the sum total of a bunch of human events that have taken place. But maybe you've heard this before. I'd I'd like to redefine what history really is. Because history is his story. It's God's story. It's his plan. Emmanuel is God with us. And it's much more than God simply joining our activities here on, on earth or for him to be part of our plan. No, Emmanuel means that we have access to 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 God and God's plan. (laughs) I think the most humbling part of all this is that we just need to get over that life is not about our plan. We just need to get over that. We keep grabbing for it. We keep going back to it all the time. It's about us joining what God is already doing what God is already accomplishing. And God often chooses the most unlikely ways to accomplish his plan. It was true then, and it's true today for us, December 12th, 2021. As we're closing this morning, I just want to make a couple, I think they're universal observations about God's plan. God's plan. You see, as I see and I look through history, I, one of the observations that I have is, is that God is not a special occasion or God is not a, okay, someday when I have time, God, sort of God. No, God's not about saying, you know, I'll catch up you, with you when I'm not as busy, when COVID's over or when I get everything organized, then let's do coffee together, God. Let's do coffee. That sounds so awful, doesn't it? To think of putting God in that sort of a place. He's not just about special occasions or when I'm done with the more important things, then we'll talk sort of thing. No, he's a 24-7 God. He's a 24-7 God. And, and we will be most alive. We will be most fulfilled in our life. We will experience life in all of its fullness when we trust God 24-7. 24-7. He wants to be our Savior and He wants to be our leader 
all the time. Another observation. We've talked about this one several times, but God is almost always best found in stillness. Found in stillness. There's a feeling in in many hearts and minds, maybe yours, that God is distant and detached from us. And I hear people talking about all the time about their attempts to, to find God. To find God. Well, let me say this in no uncertain terms. God's not hiding. God is not hiding from you. He's not. He's not distant. Psalm 46, a verse we often quote, Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. And we can experience God with us by, by simply just making time to be with Him. We're so much more used to noise and activity, and God calls us to a quiet place calls us to stillness, just God in you, God in me. Time with your Bible, time with your Advent devotional readings, maybe. God's in the stillness, and he's, he's always communicating with us. And the question is, are we listening? Similar to we can hear him in the stillness, the, the, my final observation is that, is that God is always there. He's always there. Psalm 139, one of my favorite psalms, David affirms very early on something that uh, in, in, in our society, uh, we, we say this is kind of creepy thinking, but when it's God, it's not at all. He says, God knows everything about us. God knows everything about us. He's always there. He's always with you when you're awake or asleep, when you're working or playing, when you're singing. When you're driving your car or eating, he's with you and me, even right now as we gather in this place with our church family or gather online. He's with our team in Agua Prieta right now. The overwhelming direction of Scripture does not start with us wanting to be with God. It's God coming to us. God comes to us. It's always God who takes the initiative. It's God's longing. It's his desire. It's his passion to have a relationship with us. He just wants us to trust him. He just wants us to trust him. Isaiah 43, 2 says it like this. It says, don't be afraid. He says, when you walk through deep waters, he said, I'll be there. I'll be there. He's here. He's here. He's promised it. He has sent His Son, and He's coming back. And in the meantime, God is here. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's Emmanuel. He is God with us. He's here. He always has been. And He always will be. Let's pray. God, what an amazing promise that is. And we thank you that um, we don't need to invite you. You've, you've, you're inviting us all the time, and we, we want to just accept that invitation that, 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 sh- that you're giving. Thank you for your willingness to be with us, God with us, Emmanuel. And every day, Lord, we want to trust you more, more completely. Help us to be still and grow more secure in your very capable leading that that, that when there's a choice of paths, God, that that we always want to choose yours because we know that we can trust you. We pray this in the name of Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. In his name we pray. Amen.